This is lecture seven, personal requirements for IE 4355 facilities planning. The material of this lecture is also presented in the textbook in chapter four uh, with the title personal requirements. The objectives for, for the class uh, are listed in this slide and I'm highlighting the one that is more connected to this lecture. Uh, which is to develop an understanding of the principles of facilities location, layout, and material handling systems, and to practice designing facilities. The agenda for this lecture is I'm going to start with the with an introduction to, to this topic, and then we're going to talk about the employee and the things that are important to consider from the employee perspective when designing a facility. We're gonna talk about the design of restrooms, the design of office spaces, and also we are going to discuss some important uh, rules to consider when uh, designing uh, for barrier-free compliance. Uh, some of the learning objectives for this lecture is to learn how to plan for some of the personal requirements into a facility, parking, restroom, and office spaces. So as an introduction, the planning of personal requirements includes planning for employee parking, locker rooms, restrooms, food services, drinking fountains, and health services. So when we are designing a facility for a company in which we are gonna be producing uh, some items or producing a specific product, the facility needs to accommodate for personal requirements. And in this list, I'm, I'm discussing some of the, the most important ones, parking, locker rooms, restrooms, and so on. So the facilities planner must integrate barrier-free designs in addressing the personal requirements of the facility. So let's talk about the, the employee facility interface. An interface between an employee's work and non-work activities must be provided. As in the picture, I'm showing an employee that have access to to a, a, a rack uh, or a space in which he can put his, his uh, personal belongings when he, he arrives to, to the job. So the interface functions as a storage area for personal property of the employee during work hours. Personal property typically includes cars and employees' personal belongings, such as coats, clothes, purses, launches, sometimes the cell phones and so on. So we need to design to accommodate these needs. So let's start by looking at, at one of the important aspects, which is the employee parking. Uh, the procedure to plan for a parking lot is the following. First, we need to determine the number of cars to be parked by type of car. Number two, we need to determine the space required for each car. Number three is to determine the available space for parking. Uh, so if you are going to build a new facility, you need to understand how much of that space is going to occupy by the actual building and how much extra space you have for parking or other areas of the of the company. Determine, number four, determine alternative parking layouts for alternative park, parking patterns. Number five is to select the layout that best uses space and maximizes employee convenience. The number of parking spaces to be provided must be specifically determined for each facility and must be in accordance with the local zoning regulations. Although minimum requirements can be as low as two handicapped spaces per 100 spaces, five handicapped spaces per 100 parking spaces is not uncommon. So this is from the um, 
perspective of the designing a facility that are in compliance with the regulations. Uh, and also we want to accommodate the, the needs of employees that have uh, some type of, of handicap uh, need. The size of, of a parking space for a car, which is expressed as the stall width times the stall depth can vary from 5.5 to times 12 feet to 9.5 times 19 feet. The total area required for a park car depends on the size of the parking space, the parking angle, and the aisle width. In figure one, which shows the recommended range of stalls width in feet for various car types and, and uses. So depending, for example, we have here different type of, of cars. Um, so a small car use about eight uh, feet. Um, all day park air use maybe a little 8.5, uh, luxury and elderly use about 10, supermarket, a market and camper use about 11, and then handicap use, uh, so it's about 12 feet. The factors to be considered in determining the specification for a parking lot are first, the percentage of cars to be parked that are compact. Um, so 33% of all parking is often allocated to compact cars. Number two is increasing the area provided for parking decreases the amount of time required to park and the park. So providing extra space is, is good, but at the same time, if you provide too much space, then you will be limited in terms of the number of parking spaces that you can accommodate. Angular configurations allow quicker turnover. Perpendicular parking often yields greater space utilization, although it is also requires wider aisles. As the angle of a parking space increases, so does the required space allocated to aisles. So in figure number two, we have four different modules that are used for designing parking spaces. They are named W1, W2, W3, and W4. And they are different according to the type of, of um, module, obviously, uh, according to the type of, of design. Um, so for example, W1, uh, as you can see, has only a, a single load, meaning that you only have a line of cars to be parked and then the, the aisle. If you move to W2, now you have um, two, two lines of cars and, and an aisle in, in between. As you can see, the space required for a W2 module is, is, is greater in terms of the width than a W1 because again, W1 has only one line of cars, but also in W1, we have a wall-to-wall -wall design, meaning that the, the cars are facing a wall, uh, which is not always the case. Um, W2 is also double loaded wall-to-wall, -wall. but if, you, if we move to W3, is, you can see that it, it is double load, but it only has a wall, one is, is shown here. Um, and then in this piece of W3, there's no wall. Um, so again, the, the space in between, it's changing according to those characteristics. So if you have single load, double load, uh, if you have a wall or you have only a concrete curve or nothing like in this case. So the number of uh, the space that you are going to have in the aisle and the space that you will need to, to design something like in module W3 will change depending on, on the angle, 
uh, also. So the angle is shown here. This angle is important. Um, so in this slide, we are, we are showing the different type of modules. In this particular uh, course, we're gonna be focusing on these W1, W2, W3, and W4 modules for designing a, a parking uh, for, for a facility. Uh, PW is computed uh, as, as shown here. So again, the, the angle is, is very important. Um, this is um, is the stall width. PW is the parking width. So again, these three things are going to determine the, the width of the actual module. So we're going to have to consider the PW, parking width, the stall width, and also the angle. There are tab tabulated uh, tables already. So if you have this information, you will be able to gather the, the width for the, for the parking spaces using the information. So here we have the, the tabulated tables uh, that presents the module width for each car group as a function of a single and double loader module options. So, so we have a car, uh, a table here tabulated by type of car. So group one are small cars, group two are standard cars. So, um, and we have the, the stall width and we have the modules. So module one, module three, module three and four. And we also have the angle. So the angles are listed here at the top. So if you're designing, um, let's say you want to use one of these four modules. So let's say you're picking a, a module two, which is a double low wall to wall design. Then you will go here and say, okay, I, wanna, I want to design that type of module for small cars. And I want to use a, an angle of 50 or 60 or 75 degrees. This is going to be your width for that module. So the width in terms of this space, right? That space. Um, and that's the information you need in order to know how many of those modules you can accommodate in your parking. So that's the information that is provided here for small cars, for standard cars. Uh, we are using stall width. I mean, we have different options depending on the, of the cars. And then we have large cars. So using the information for figures one, two, and table one, the facilities planner can generate several parking layout alternatives. The goal is to optimize the space allocated for parking and maximize the employee convenience. So here I have an example that we are going to discuss as part of this lecture. Uh, so in the example, a new facility is to have 200 employees. A survey of similar facilities indicates that one parking space must be provided for every two employees and that 40% of all cars driven to work are compact cars. 5% of the spaces should be allocated for handicap. The available parking lot space is 180 feet wide and 200 feet deep. Assuming no walls and no walking edge, determine the best parking layout using stall width of eight feet and six inch, inches for standard cars. Okay, so in this, uh, we can start by looking at the number of spaces. So out of the 100 spaces, 40 could be for compact cars. However, not all drivers of compact cars will park in a compact space. And, and that's typically what we, we observe. Therefore, we are gonna design only for 30 compact car spaces in this uh, example. Um, then we're gonna begin 
the layout of the lot using 90 degrees double loaded two-way traffic because of its efficient use of space to determine if the available lot is adequate. Uh, so from figure two, W4 is required, is the required module option. Um, and that's based on, on this description, assuming no walls and no walking edge. So for that type of design, we are gonna use W4 module. And using this data, W4, 90 degrees and eight inches, um, eight feet and six inches. We are gonna go back to table one or uh, 4.1 to obtain the, the data that we need. So for this problem, This is the information that we, we obtain. Um, so for compact cars, um, we know that this is the only measurement or the only option in terms of measurements. So we, if we design for compact cars, 90 degrees and using a W4, then the module width would be 57 feet and two inches. So if I go to the table, I'm looking at small cars or compact cars. Um, we change the color. So I'm looking at small cars, a W4 and 90 degrees. So the width of that module is 57 feet and two inches. So if I go here, that's the module width that I'm going to use for compact cars. Uh, for standard cars, um, again, with 90 degrees and W4, the module width will be 66 feet and zero inches. So if we go back here, um, we get W4, 8.6 and 90 degrees, that's 66 feet. Uh, feet. And that's the the information. So using this information, we can proceed. We're gonna check to see if the depth of the lot, 200 feet can accommodate a parking layout consisting of two modules of standard cars and one compact module. So how do we find out? So for two, um, standard cars and we know those may the measurement is 66 feet plus one for compact car which has a measurement of 57 feet and two inches this is going to be equal to 189 feet and two inches and we know that that is less than 200 feet, which is the depth. Therefore, depth requirement is satisfied. Okay, so each compact module row will yield a ca car capacity based on the width of the lot, which is 180 feet, divided by the width requirement per stall, which is eight feet times the rows per module.
So if in, in, in this case, is it's a W4, we're gonna have two, two rows of parking spaces per module. Um, so if we look at the, the width of the lot is 180. Um, we can divide that by the width requirement per stall, which is eight feet. And we can multiply that times two because we're gonna have two lanes. So that's gonna be equal to 44 potential compact cars. Similarly, each standard module row will yield a car capacity based on the width of the lot, which is 180 feet divided by the width requirement per stall, which is 8.5 feet, times the number of rows per module, which is gonna be two times the number of modules. So in this case, we have two modules for standard cars. So looking at the 180 feet of width divided by 8.5 times the number of lanes, times the number of modules for uh, standard cars, this is gonna be equal to 84 potential standard cars. So the total possible is gonna be 44 plus 84, which is 128, which is greater than the required number. Therefore, module configuration W4 is feasible. A possible alternative of two rows divided by modules times two standard modules plus two rows modules uh, times one compact module for a total of six rows is a standard a starting point for the layout. Modifying the layout to account for handicap requirements and circulation reveals the following. So we're gonna have a total of six rows. So based on our design, we have something like this. And we say this is 180. And this is 200. Obviously this is not up to scale. And we said that we have three modules, one for standard cars and two for, um, I'm sorry, one for compact cars and two for standard cars. So we're gonna have three modules in total, right? And each, in each module, we're gonna have parking spaces And something like this. Okay, so this is module one, module two, module three. Um, so we can give a name to each one of the rows or a number. So we're gonna have six rows. Um, and then we want to modify the layout to account for handicap requirements and circulation. So we can say that row one will handle the require five handicapped spaces. Which width is 12 feet. So five times 12 feet, 12 feet is equal to 60 feet. 
And we can say that the remaining spaces in that row will be occupied by standard cars. which is gonna be equal to 180 minus 60 divided by 8.5, that gives you 14 spaces. row adjusting for two rec for two circulation lanes of 15 feet We can compute that based on, on, on having circulation lanes, we will lose some, some of those spaces, right? So uh, we need to know how many um, spaces we're gonna, we're gonna have in, let's say, the rows that are in the middle, not in the, on the sides. So this row, this row, this row, and this row are going to be affected by the circulation lanes on this side and on this side. So road adjusting for two circulation lanes of 15. Um, so each, Then we will have to compute the number of spaces that we're gonna have after that. So 180 minus the space that are going to occupy those uh, two circulation lanes divided by 8.5. And that's gonna be 17 spaces. row three and four will yield the same number of spaces. Right, because we call this one two, we call this one three, and we call this one four. Uh, so these first four modules are for standard cars. This module right here is for compact cars. So that's why row three and four would yield the same number of spaces because those rows are for standard cars. Uh, now row five will, is for compact. So row five, We'll have a hundred and eighty minus thirty, which again is this is fifteen times two because of the circulation lanes. 
divided by eight, which is the width of compact cars. So that means that you can have 18 spaces in row five, which is this row right here. And then row C six, row six is not affected by the circulation links. So that will handle Uh, 180 divided by eight, which is 22 spaces. So again, we have three modules. Each module will have two lanes of parking spaces. Uh, so this first group of modules are for standard cars. Uh, so we computed how many spaces we can have per per module and also per lane. Uh, again, two lanes per, per module. So a total of four lanes um, for standard cards. And we know that three of those lanes are going to be affected by the circulation lanes. So that's why we lose some, some space that 30 feet is, is lost because we need to have those circulation lanes for those first, uh, for lanes two, three, and four. Now, if we go to the last module, and again, and, and before I forget, the first lane has the handicapped spaces. And then the last module, which is the one here, this last module, um, is for compact cars. So we, for lane five, we are adjusting for the circulation lane, but lane six is not affected by the circulation lane. So that's why we can have more spaces uh, in that one. So if we add this and this, this is giving us about 22 plus 18, 40 spaces for uh, compact cars. And then if we add this um, plus three times this, we have the total of 65 standards, cars, parking spaces. And then we have five um, handicapped spaces, which is the summary we have right here. So we have a better picture of the parking uh, lot, for example, one. And then we have a summary of the total number of cars that we have uh, per, per group, compact, standard, and handicapped. Okay, so now let's transition to the, the restrooms. The restroom should be located within 200 feet of every permanent workstation. The recommended minimum number of toilets or water closets for the number of employees working within the facility is given in table two, which we're gonna show next. Um, in restrooms for males, a urinal may substitute may be substitute for a toilet uh, provided that the number of toilets is not reduced to less than two thirds the minimum recommended. For space planning purposes, 12.5 feet square or 15 should be allowed for each toilet and six feet square for each urinal. Toilets and urinals must be designed to accommodate wheelchairs for handicapped employees as well. So here's uh, the table, table two. Uh, it shows the plumbing fixtures requirement for the number of employees. And it will depend on the type of, of business, right? So we have here mercantile, industrial, other than foundry and storage. Uh, we have industrial foundries and storage, and then we have assembly other than that, religious and schools. And for each one of them, we can see how many water closets are needed depending on the number of employees and how many lavatories depending on the number of employees. And it will change depending on the type of industry. As you can see here, since this type of industry will require more cleaning, 
for the employees, you'll see that the number of water clauses will be uh, more. Um, so let's, for example, for 10, you will have one water closet. In this case, you will go up to 15 um, and so on. So here we have a, a layout for typical fixtures, uh, clearances based on the New Year's State Labor Code for a restroom. Uh, you can see the minimum required between lavatories and the minimum uh, space required per toilet um, and so on. Um, in terms of office planning, according to Dr. Becker, the director of Cornell University International Workspace uh, Works Place Studies Program, the fundamental idea is that people should work on their conditions that they can be most efficient. Location and time should be a secondary importance. So he asked, why not create an office where the probability of bumping into people for exchange of ideas is increased? Um, and that's something that we can see in many uh, companies, uh, big name companies now, like Facebook and Google. They will have all these open spaces with collaboration in, in which you can see the other people, uh, there's no walls and so on. So important influences on the development of the office design. We have the office technology, office organization, building construction, and real estate factors. Offices differ from factories in at least three ways. Um, the product, the physical environment, and the social environment. And the goal of the office layout is to minimize communication costs and maximize employee productivity. How is that achieved? By teamwork plus telecommunications. Uh, the criteria for evaluation of office layouts First is the suitability, operational effectiveness. Second is the flexibility, the possibility of efficient change and growth. Habitability, the features and facilities to achieve efficiency and advancement of administrative profession, state-of-the-art offices, planning and design. Uh, in terms of the type of office arrangements, we have three conventional office, the landscape office, and the open plan office. The conventional arrangement um, separate the higher ranking of individuals from the rest of the personnel. Characteristics of the arrangement include private offices for higher ranks, no partitions between desks, no plans, straight lines, and desks only. So here's a typical layout for those purposes. So you see the bosses in one wall and they can see everybody working. You feel that you are observed most of the time, uh, straight lines, no space for collaboration and so on. The landscape arrangement, um, the mindset is that officers must be down in with the troops. So the characteristics of the arrangement is that there's no private offices some partitioning due to the furniture. There are plants, there's no straight lines. Desks are arranged at random and there's some storage units. So here's a, a couple of pictures that look at the type of arrangement. Uh, crooked parts replace the straightforward aisles and corridors and desks are arranged in order to minimize communication costs. The open plan arrangement, uh, this is called the action office. Characteristics include a few private offices, extensive use of partitions, plants, straight and curved lines, work surfaces, storage units, and so on. Currently a report revealed that uh, average US and Canada offices environment now has 52% open plan. Open plan office is furnished 
as one integrated office and will be invariably partitioned into smaller offices. So these cubicles, uh, this is very common in the United States. Partitioning itself normally consists of screens, but many consists solely of plants in pots or stands. The open plan office generally accommodates staff from different levels and is favored by firms adopting the one-stop shop approach. Open plan and modular furniture allow more people in the same area, less arrangement costs, less energy costs, and possibly more productivity. So here's some examples um, of those uh, layouts. So again, we have uh, partitioning, uh, maybe technology is different now, but the idea is the same. You have the desk and you have some type of division between the desks. This again, very common in, in, in many companies, uh, at least from my experience working and visiting and doing consulting, this is what you will see most of the time. Advantages and disadvantages uh, of this type of, of configuration, improve information flow, flexibility, democratic outlook, cost and space saving, ventilation and productivity. So there are some savings associated to it. Uh, leads to crowding, poor visual and acoustic privacy. So if you are calling someone or you are in a meeting, you are in the speaker phone, everybody will, will listen to what you're saying loss of signs of status and control of surrounding by individuals and lower quality of office air with related incidents of illness, like for example, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Special areas, um, conference meeting, training rooms, shop offices, reception areas. So for conference use, uh, for conference room use, I mentioned equipment, furniture, and illumination requirements are relevant. Uh, shop office can be prefabricated with windows that allow people to monitor activity of the factory floor, maybe used sometimes for storage. And the reception area is for security needs, number of visitors, telephone requirements, access to restroom and furniture requirements. Um, the last piece of this lecture is the barrier-free compliance. Facilities planning must incorporate the intent of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, disabled person will have the same right as the able body to full and free use of all the facilities that serve the public. A barrier is a physical object that impedes a disabled person access to the use of the facility. A door that is not wide enough to accommodate a wheelchair or stairs without ramp access to a facility are examples. Account for the handicapped person space requirements versus a, of an able body person. Uh, things like taking into account the clearance for a wheelchair. A wheelchair dimensions reach and manuality requirements. Uh, so again, the clearance, uh, also the reach for the person working in the in the workstation. Uh, turning radius is are, are very important. So here's some some standard measurements uh, for the reach and for the reach zone. What is the area of easy reach and so on. So those dimensions are very important, very relevant when designing for. Uh, barrier-free compliance. So today's uh, lecture, that's, that was the last slide. And in this lecture, we focus on the personal requirements for facilities design, including the, the employee um, needs uh, in terms of what areas are needed from the employee perspective for the design of a facility. We also talk about restroom design, office facility planning, and barrier-free compliance.